Good morning. Welcome to the First Congregational Church, where everyone's someone and Jesus is Lord. This devotion this morning is going to be a little bit different than the ones I've been doing over the past weeks. It's, that's because I've been thinking a lot about next week, next week's uh, service and what it's going to look like. Hopefully, we'll be getting together again. Hopefully, we'll all be in the same room. Um, that's not a done deal yet. The council will be meeting on Monday to make that decision. But um, after talking with many of you, I, I think that's probably the direction we're going to go. So hopefully next week will be the week. And, uh, and that's uh, exciting and that's uh, wonderful, but it also is a cause for some concern as I wonder how we as a congregation are going to deal with that, how we're going to, to handle the changes that are going to be necessary. Those of you who have seen the newsletter that went out last week, um, you'll know that there's a lot of changes coming for the to the service. Um, things like where to sit and wearing masks and what we'll be singing and how many people can be in the elevator and all those sorts of things. And, and I'm afraid that some of you um, are probably thinking that um, these changes are unnecessary. Uh, you might think that they are, are dumb. Uh, you might think that they are at least inconvenient. And, and I think uh, as far as inconvenience, anyway, you certainly are correct. And I'm afraid that others of you are out there saying uh, we shouldn't be opening at all. Um, we're not doing enough. This is not keeping our people safe. And I, I hear you and I understand what you're saying as well. And I, I want to make sure that whatever we decide to do, we do it right and we follow the Lord's will in what we're doing. But what concerns me is uh, that this is going to end up to be a discord in the church, a fight of some kind, uh, a split, a division, uh, which it shouldn't be. Um, but unfortunately, as in our society, we see it is all over the place. Uh, what ought to be uh, pretty simple decisions about keeping people safe and keeping our economy going and, and that sort of thing uh, have devolved into a partisan political fight where um, people are uh, more concerned about being right than they are about doing the right thing. And I think we as a church have to be very careful that it doesn't happen to us and that we maintain a, a model for the world of what true Christianity looks like. So I thought that today we would talk about that with the idea of next week in mind. What does Christianity look like as we walk with Jesus in times of potential discord? I think it's dealt with pretty well, uh, pretty uh, succinctly in the book of Philippians. Uh, the book of Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul. He was in a prison um, and he was uh, responding to a letter from a church at Philippi. Uh, when he got the letter, uh, it, was, it was basically the letter to him was, uh, first of all, uh, asking about him. And they were, the Philippians were concerned about Paul. They wanted to know how he was doing. And they had sent him a, a care package type of thing. Uh, to help him while he was in prison. And so when Paul wrote back, he had three things in mind that he wanted to get across. The first is to tell them that he was doing well, that, that he had learned to be content in Christ in whatever situation he found himself. The second thing he wanted to do was to say thank you. Thank you for the care package. It was, a, it was an early thank you note, if you will. And finally, he wanted to address a problem that he had heard about in the Philippian church. And that is that there was discord, that um, people were arguing. And we're not sure exactly what they were arguing about because that's not really the point of Paul's letter. And it's not really the point that we have next week. It's about the argument itself and the fact that they were having an argument and how to deal with that. So let's see what Paul has to say. This is from the book of Philippians chapter two, Starting in verse 3, we read, talking about how to deal with these arguments. Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So what he's saying, first of all, is don't be self-centered. Don't be so concerned with your own rights that you're putting others down. Um, this word self-centeredness had to do, it was a political word. It has to do with politicians who are holding themselves up. He's saying, don't hold yourselves up as the arbiter of what is right and wrong, but instead put other people's needs before your own. Don't be conceited. Don't think more of yourself than you ought, but instead worry about what other people need and want and desire and work, about, and work on that. So, the first thing that we don't want to do, we don't want to 
be looking out for our rights so much uh, that we cease to look out for the needs and desires of others. In fact, he goes on, he says here, uh, uh, count each, count the others better than yourselves. But what does he mean by that? In what way am, are you better than me or the person who sits on your left better than the person that sits on your right? Well, the idea of better has nothing to do with talent or worth to God. It has to do with a rank. Um, count others as your superior in rank. If you're a lieutenant, think of them as a general or whatever. Think of other people's needs and put their needs over your own as you would put someone who had a higher rank than you. The truth is that God loves us all and he loves us equally. Um, he doesn't like you better than he likes me or your next door neighbor. The truth is that God loves us all and we are to treat each other um, even though we are equal in God's eyes, we treat each other as better than ourselves. That's the first key and the first um, uh, cue into how we can avoid arguments and discord in the church. So the first thing is we do nothing from selfishness. We don't look out for my rights, but we look out for others, counting them as better than ourselves. That's, that's what we can do in our church. And, and as we come together next week, hopefully, Lord willing, um, we need to be careful to make sure that we're putting others' needs above our own, um, whether that means uh, wearing a face mask in order to keep others from getting sick or, or sitting in a pew we don't normally sit so that we can social distance enough to get as many people who want to come into the church. Or, or maybe it means riding the elevator one at a time, which is incredibly inconvenient, I know. Uh, but to keep others safe, that's what we're going to need to do is those sorts of things. Uh, to count others as better than ourselves, as more valuable, putting their needs, their need for safety, above our own desire to get upstairs faster. Now, that's hard to do. And so Paul, well, he understands that, and he goes on and he, he takes the ultimate example to show us what that looks like, and he uses the example of, of Jesus himself. Now, he goes on in verse 4, oh, excuse me, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. So Jesus who he was in the form of God. Now that's important. What does it mean when we say that Jesus was in the form of God? It means that that was who he was. That was his appearance to those before he was born was the appearance of God. Jesus was God. He didn't become God. He was God before the foundations of the world. He had all the attributes of God. But because of his love for us, because of his goodness towards us, he decided to put aside some of his divine attributes and become a man. So what kind of divine attributes did he put aside? Well, he was no longer omnipresent. He was no longer everywhere all the time. He was localized now in a human body. He chose not to be all-knowing or omniscient. He chose instead to limit his knowledge while on earth to the things that, that a man would know and the things that the Holy Spirit would communicate to him. He didn't, he didn't know about when the end times were coming. He says that. It's not something that um, I'm just guessing at. He says it's not for the Son of Man to know these things when asked questions where he didn't know the answer. Um, so Jesus chose to put aside some of his divine attributes. He was still God, but he put aside some things in order to become fully human so that he could die on the cross and pay for the penalty of our sins. If he had, had kept all his divine attributes, he couldn't have done that. He couldn't have died for us to bring us into the relationship he's called for us to have. So Jesus Incredibly enough, God himself deemed us worthy, deemed our need for that relationship more important than his need to be God and became a man to pay the penalty for our sins. If Jesus, if our God can do that for us, certainly we can be inconvenienced for the sake of others. 
Um, and that's what Paul is saying here. We need to put people ahead of ourselves, just like Christ put us ahead of himself. We have to have the mind of Christ. That's what having the mind of Christ is all about, the attitude of putting other people first. Now, we do that not just in church. Of course, we ought to be doing that throughout the community. But church is a really good place to practice that, that practice having that mind of Christ. And so when you come next week, Lord willing, it is next week, or if not, whenever it, it turns out to be our first week back here, uh, we're, we are going to need to practice putting other people first. That might mean wearing a face mask, even though you hate wearing face masks. I know I do. Uh, and yet, for the sake of other people, you're going to be asked to put one on. Please, please do that. It might be um, the inability to sit wherever you want. I know that we've had that issue in the past when we were checking out the sound system and we asked people to sit in certain spots. There were some who were angry and some who said, I have the right to sit wherever I want in church. But you know, just because we have the right doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And so please, when you come in, sit where you're directed to sit um, and worship God by by putting other people, other people first in that situation. Uh, it may be um, inconvenient to ride the elevator one at a time. It may be inconvenient to have to wait to go into the restroom until someone leaves. Um, there are going to be those kind of inconveniences. But we as Christians can practice putting other, people's for, other people first here at the church and then taking that out into the community. God has been so, so good to us. And we as Christians are called to pay that forward by being good to others as well. Will you do that next Sunday? Will you do that in the week between now and then and the week after? Will you practice putting other people first, having the mind of Christ in selflessness and humility and being the person that God has called you to be? I hope so. And if tempted not to do that, just remember how good God has been to you.
let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your love and your humility and your decision to put aside for a while your attributes of deity in order to come to earth to pay the penalty for our sins and to create the relationship with us that we were created to have. Thank you, Lord God. Help us to follow your example. Help us to have your mind in all that we do. Help us to be good to others as you have been so good to us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that that's possible as your spirit works in us. And so we give ourselves to you in the coming weeks and months. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless.